Hello everyone, my name is Adi Tolak and today I am with SAP Data Unleashed and we are going to discuss why you should rethink data. And today I have my dear friend with me, Tim. Tim, how about you introduce yourself? Great to be here. I'm Tim Crawford, CIO and Strategic Advisor with Avoa. And having been an SAP customer in the past, um, I bring a little bit of a different context uh, to the conversation. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like, we've been discussing a little bit before around data and how the world is evolving and kind of this big data moment that you know we're all taking part in. I'm curious, like, why should we rethink data? Well, you know, I think a lot of folks, they, they start off and they kind of go, ho-hum, okay, new, new day, new conversation around data. This time it's a little different. And this time we have to kind of take note and take a different approach. And there are a couple of reasons for that. But let me start with maybe a conversation around what it is we need to think about. So the difference that we need to go into today is really kind of putting context around data. It's no longer as simple as saying, well, I've got the sales order, or I've got this insights to um, a set of customers, and I'm trying to, to gain uh, further engagement through those. But we have to bring additional color to the conversation. And so that color comes in the form of context, and some of that data may be within our enterprise, some of it may be outside of our enterprise. But the combination of it is what really kind of sets it apart from what we've done in the past. And the tools have been really complicated in the past to be able to, to really kind of bring it together. Mm -hmm. But now what you're starting to see is it's a much more streamlined effort to be able to bring these different data elements together to provide that rich contextual data that gives you those insights that we've been clamoring for forever and a day. For ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really interesting because it's a moment in time that we're seeing this huge renaissance movement in the data space. There's a lot of different philosophies, concepts, paradigms, principles that we're starting to adopt. And, you know, not for all of them we kind of have a fixed solution, so we don't necessarily know how to implement the technology. But we do see that there is a huge potential if we are open to rethink data. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm curious from your perspective, because you've been working a lot with you know, customers and enabling people to actually implement and, and build those systems. Like, what are the real challenges that people are facing when they, are, when they need to rethink data today? Well, I think the first thing is inertia. If you look back in time, you know, there's been 10, 20, 30 years of inertia that has driven us to a certain way that we look at enterprise data. And that needs to change. We need to change course. But before we change course on how we manage the data, how we use the data, we need to back up for a second. And we need to change the whole vernacular and lens that we look at data through. And I think that first piece is saying, what is the business problem that we're trying to solve first and foremost? Now the business problem might be, I'm going after a new market, I'm expanding my revenue opportunities within an existing market, going after new customers, going into a new geography. I mean, there are many different ways that there are these business problems that get elevated to an executive level that the stakeholders are really focused on. We have to understand what are those top mm -hmm. business problems we're trying to solve for, and then bring the context down to say, okay, what is the data that we need in order to provide better access to information, better insights, faster access to information so we can make better business decisions and have a more uh, accurate outcome of what we expect to see. And I think the combination of those together has been really complicated for folks, plus all this inertia has kind of sent us in a different direction. Setting that aside and starting with that business context first really changes the conversation because now everyone is aligned around a common context rather than just simply, hey, we've got this new whiz-bang tool and we've got this tool and you've got a piece of data and I've got a piece of data and let's put it together and do some really cool stuff. That's mildly interesting, but it's, you know, it's, not, it's not as interesting as saying, wow, we changed the, the total trajectory of our company, yeah. right? That's a totally different conversation to have. And I think that's one of the pieces that we're seeing from the most successful companies today. 
And especially as we're coming out of the pandemic, we're seeing customers and the way that they engage with companies changing demonstrably, right? We have to think differently about how we engage with customers. And it's not just the customers, but it's the employees and, and how they're engaging with customers, because it's not just you or I in any given company, but it's a whole team of folks. But we also have to think about the technology and the data that goes along with that, right? So that all of this comes together and really has a different outcome than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, so it reminds me a lot about, well, essentially it's a lot about change. Mm -hmm. And change is scary, right? There's a lot of fear involved in it. I have something that already kind of works, right? It delivers value. There might be some more potential, but you know, every new potential comes with a risk. Mm -hmm. So how can we align, let's say a whole company around that motion of we're going to make this change it's going to enable us greater growth as you mentioned right in breaking into new fields new geographies and so on and making sure everyone understands the value that you know the kind of the vision to drive that forward because fear can be destructive it can be destructive it can be a very interesting motivator not necessarily a good motivator though I do think that, um, especially when you're talking about the typical SAP customer, which is going to be a very large enterprise, there's a lot of risk that comes with change. Um, I've lived in large enterprise most of my career, and I'll tell you firsthand, making changes requires a lot of forethought, a lot of planning, a lot of replanning, a lot of testing before you even get to the execution, which might be months or years out. Wow. And so the reason why you do that is because if something does go sideways, it has an incredible impact to your company. I mean, look at some of the biggest companies that, that are going through this transformation right now. Take a major airline, for example. They need to change. They might be running on a, an antiquated system. They want to move to a more modern platform, be able to leverage data either for loyalty programs, baggage uh, tracking, um, engagement with third-party systems, um, you know, kind of the, the making points and spending points. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that, that the airline has to operate on a 24 by 7 fashion. Well, the challenge is, if you're going to make a change to a core system like an airline's operations, um, and that goes sideways, now you've taken down that airline for that period of time that the system is down. And you can't necessarily just simply back out of some of these systems and go, okay, we screwed up, we messed up, we didn't figure something out, and we're going to go back to the old version. That, a lot of times that, that's no longer an option. Yeah. You have to just, you have to cut and move, and you have to just go with it. And so companies are hesitant to do that because they know that the risk associated with change is great. As opposed to a smaller company, maybe there's a little bit of, you know, a little bit of ease that if something doesn't quite go right, you know what, sorry, our systems were down, um, can you come back tomorrow? Sure, you know, it's not a big deal, it's the corner market. As opposed to that major airline, gee, sorry, you know, we took down the airline for 24 hours, what's the impact, right? And so I think it's important to put context around it but it's also important to understand how can you de-risk hmm. these big changes, these big, huge changes. And so picking apart the pieces and being able to separate them is a way to de-risk it. That de-risk process, though, is really complicated in its own right and is not for the faint of heart. And so, again, you come back to, well, wait, if I go down this path, that's problematic. If I go down this path, that's problematic. So. Maybe I just don't do anything, to your earlier yeah. point. The reality is we can't sit there. Mm. We have to make change happen. And so I don't think it's fear that's going to drive us. I think it's the buildup of the opportunity in that future state that actually is what we're clamoring for. That's what we need to focus on. That's really interesting. And that kind of you know brings back what you started with, as you need to know what's the why and what's the real motivation. Mm -hmm. I believe once a person is looking at the opportunity, right, and rather than the risk, like being mindful of the risk, you need to manage those risks. You need to de-risk, like mm -hmm. you mentioned, and really you know delve into the nitty-gritty and the details to understand what, what it entails. Um, 
being able to look at the motivation and the potential can sometimes help people gain the courage mm -hmm. in order to do the things that fear kind of blocks us from doing uh, and taking those steps yeah. forward. And, you know, that's great. When I'm thinking about it as an individual, I get it, right? I can build my own system, how to deal with that, and so on. How can I work with people in the company to secure those buy-ins, to kind of untang you know, untangle those fears? Because people have been doing it for years, right? They've been using the same systems. It's, it's antique, for sure. Mm -hmm. But it works. So how can I bring people along the journey with me if I want to kind of enable a company to rethink it and you know not beyond maybe the leadership team or executive team uh, and so on. So I think the first thing is to have an honest conversation with yourself. And so I think as a leader, you have to determine who's part of the program and who's not in the future state program. Mm. And as you go through and you assess your organization, you'll quickly figure out that there are some folks that they get it, they see where it's going, or they can, they can adapt accordingly and help you along in that journey uh, to be successful. There will always be some that they're not long for the journey. They're, they're comfortable where they are. They're going to fight against change. They're going to hold you back. And so it's important to have this kind of heart-to-heart conversation with yourself as a leader about your organization first and foremost. The second step is transparency. And I've always believed in my teams, I'm going to be just brutally honest. Here's how it plays out. You know what? It, it works and some things don't work. And we have to be prepared for that. And that gets me to the third point, which is you can do all of the planning you want, but inevitably something will fail at some point in time. The challenge is you don't know when it's going to fail or what's going to fail. And so it's always important to have that kind of backspin to be able to say, okay, here's the ideal situation, but if something doesn't go right, I have my plan B ready to go. And everybody's on board with it, they understand what that means, and we're able to react accordingly. Most organizations and even individuals are measured not on what they succeed with, but how they react to problems that arise. And so having that with these big systems helps, and the transparency helps kind of de-risk from an organizational standpoint, right, within your own org, but it also gives you a little bit of air cover across the organization too so that people start to understand, look, this is a big change. We're going to do everything we can to make sure that we are successful with this. But anyone that's worked in IT for any period of time knows technology is not perfect. It's built by humans. We're not perfect. And so I think that's an important attribute to understand is as you go down this path, what is that plan B just so you are ready and you've tested that as well? And that hopefully you never have to go to it, but it's important to, to always think about that. And especially with these really big complicated systems, you hope for the best and a lot of times it works out just fine. But every once in a while you get a wild hair that goes sideways and, and you have to act accordingly. Makes sense. Yeah, you mentioned, so you mentioned data systems and there's a lot of complexity yeah. built into it and kind of being able to rally everyone together, especially, so we discussed a lot of the different parts of kind of how we bring people into this mm -hmm. change. But thinking through like how engineers today are adopting some of the technologies. So what is the level of involvement that we can actually bring the engineers that at the end of the day are dealing you know, with the actual infrastructure and the IT and building those systems to kind of take active part and maybe you know, even in ownership or something along these lines yeah. in order for them to be part of this change, kind of you know, feel it, understand it, um, make it their own. Essentially. Yeah. I think going back to what I was saying earlier about transparency, is making sure that everyone from the most senior person in your org to the most junior person in your org knows what the game plan is. Mm. They, they know what we're here for, they know what, what we're doing, and they know what their role is on the team. And when you have that in place, they have a sense of ownership in this too. Mm. Because they can clearly see line of sight between what they're doing and the work that they're doing with the outcome that you're organizationally aligned to do. And so, 
when you do that, it also kind of creates a camaraderie and a culture within the team that helps align decisions such that someone in a different part of your org might make a decision, but they know how that impacts another part of the org. So it, you don't get into this um, consternation around everybody has to be involved in every decision just to make sure that we don't miss something, but rather people start to understand, okay, I know how you're thinking, I know what's important to you, let me get on this path and I'm gonna make decisions as if you were sitting right next to me for the journey. The other piece to when you talk about data is we have to think about the appropriate use of data. Mm -hmm. And this is becoming incredibly more important as we go through time. It's no longer just regulatory and compliance, but now we have privacy, we have sovereignty laws that we have to adhere to. And all of those are incredibly complicated. I mean, just here in the United States alone, if you look at state privacy laws, like just here, in, we're in New York, here in New York compared to California, there are components that actually conflict with one another. And so when you start to look at, at how these different states kind of play out, you're gonna to start to realize that managing data appropriately is gonna get really complicated really fast. Oh, and by the way, that's just in the US. Now you start to go across borders into other regions, into other countries, and it just gets com much more complicated as we go through time. So I do think thinking about um, regulatory compliance and privacy is one thing, but then the sec second piece to that, or second subset to that, is the appropriate use of data, right? We don't want to misuse that customer data. We want to use it in, appropriate, in an appropriate way that that trust is not violated mm -hmm. with the customer. Because as soon as you violate that trust, they're gone, and they're not coming back. And the last thing we want is just to contribute to more churn within our customer data and our customer organization. Yeah, we definitely don't want to do that, for sure. We yeah. want to build the trust and maintain trust throughout the years. Trust in data is, is a key piece that companies are just now really starting to kind of get their arms around and think about. There's still a lot of work to be done. I don't want to, don't want to convey that companies have it all figured out. They don't. Um, and there is some kind of give and take too. You know, some companies have a little more leeway with their customers than others. Um, but they have to figure out where that where that balance is, where that appropriate balance is. Got it. Keeping an open open mind, kind of a growth mindset. Well, keeping an open mind from the company perspective is one thing, but you also have to anticipate what your customers Wants. want, mm -hmm. right? Because it doesn't matter what you or I want within our company. If the customer doesn't agree to it, it doesn't matter, right? So we have to think about it from their perspective and what they get from it, or potentially the consequences if we violate that trust. Got it. Well, Tim, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. I learned a lot today, and I'm sure your audience learned a lot as well. Um, thank you so much for jumping in today and yeah, being thanks. with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was SAP Data Unleashed. Thank <laughs> you.